so good to see your faces. Um, and I have enjoyed reading many of your books and your uh, studies, and it's a dream come true to have you all here to do this. Um, as I hear the name Charles Joyner, just briefly, I want to say that he taught me a very important lesson. Do your scholarship well. And with Charles Joyner, it was always about the scholarship first. And, um, and he would be, Chaz would be, tickled pink to have this conference here. And um, not only one to honor Charles, but in the dark days when Bella Geechee was not fashionable. We had some early pioneers. I'm not sure if they're here or not, but um, Ron Fitzgerald, I believe, is here. Is Emory Campbell here for a chance? Yes. Please stand. Please stand. It saddens me to not have Herman Blake here. And um, he's um, mentioned that he wasn't up to it. He said, Eric, you'll know once you get older. <laughs> so Herman, and I um, also want to recognize in his absence, Peter Rutkoff, who couldn't be here today. He had a, uh, a stroke two weeks ago. He called from the hospital saying, Eric, I'm learning how to walk. I can't come. I said, well, Peter, take care of that first, please. <laughs> um, I want to also mention that you know, we've, we've been very fortunate here at, at Tom Coast to have a young university that's ambitious and one of their goals beyond marine science is Gullah. And, and they really have been committed to Gullah history, Gullah preservation, and we just have been awarded a, a national archives grant. And um, as we digitize as many Gullah archives as we can and put it on a a website. I've learned a new word, metadata. And so, um, in this, and I hope that for all universities, there's a new model about archives. It's not e enough to simply put something on your own site. You know, we need to give some context to it, and it should be a collaboration. And so, I have all your emails now. And so I will be asking you all to help us out on this endeavor. It's a two-year project, but actually it will be probably five, ten years and growing as we give context to having a sole site just for the Olegesia and Athenasco studies. So that now, <laughs> just as we know Cajun and, and the blues and jazz and Creole, Everyone in this world should know Kalagichi and the African diaspora. It's that important. Um, I'm going to now introduce our keynote know, speaker, Sheila Walker. And um, I was trying to find someone who, who would give us the feeling and, and kind of um, hold on to both sides of our focus, the African diaspora and the Kalagichi. And I came across the film, Familiar Faces in Unfamiliar Places, and it is a wonderful film. And if you get a chance, YouTube it. Familiar Faces in Unfamiliar Places. It's a phenomenal film by her. She's an anthropologist, filmmaker, and director of the Apple, Apple Diaspora, a nonprofit organization that is developing documentaries, educational materials about the global African diaspora. Um, her other films include Slave Routes, A Global Vision, Scattered Africa, Faces and Voices of the African Diaspora. And uh, her books include, it's in Spanish, I won't try that right now. It's um, <laughs> Afro South Americans Speak of Their Peoples and Their History. And my favorite book, uh, it's been on my bathroom reading list. It's called African Roots, American Cultures. Africa and the creation of the Americas. Um, I loved, and I found this as a uh, person who loves uh, research, I found a quote from her. It says, when I was in college, scholars who studied the Negro problem assert that African Americans were the only US ethnic group with no culture, and definitely no links to the African culture, heritage. At the same time, the government was exporting jazz and gospel music around the world as centerpieces of cultural diplomacy programs 
He's in creation of, of this allegedly non-existent American culture to represent the national culture of the United States. And adolescent summer living with an African family in Barmum, Barmum, I knew it was good, but Kingdom in the Academy Room made me aware of cultural continuities with, with my denied African heritage. That experience inspired me to become an anthropologist and study communities of African origin, focusing on the similarities and differences, connections with their African roots, and contributions to the nations in which they exist. I look forward to you all meeting Shil Walker, and I guarantee you will be amazed. Shil Walker. as a Rogichigoa culture 
as a jumping off place to talk about some elements of this global African diaspora. Um, and Sterling Stuckey in his book, Slave Culture, that's, I'm rereading it, and he talks about the ring shout as the emblematic uh, element of, where's the image? <laughs> uh, okay, the emblematic element of Gullah Geechee culture that is a, uh, hang on, okay. Uh, he used it as a metaphor for how African Americans, mainly, mainly talking about the United States, preserved African culture, became a people in the United States. So, um, I made a little presentation here to, it needs a little more volume. There's my title, From the Fusky Island to the Global African Diaspora. I knew that there was, that the most African culture in the United States existed in these islands, but I didn't know anything. I did know, however, I knew Herman Blake. And Herman Blake said, well, you gotta go to the Fusky Island. So I went to the Fusky Island. And what Herman said was, call Mr. Jake and he'll come get you. So I called Mr. Jake and <laughs> he, <came, laughs> he came and got me. And so he's taking me, he's crabbing as he's taking me to the Fusky Island on his boat. And he took me to Miss Bertha's house and that's where I stayed. And I was very struck when I saw her. She was eating in a bowl with a, with a tablespoon, and she was eating grits and some fish and some sauce. And I thought, I've seen this scene before. I had seen women with their heads tied up, eating out of a bowl with a tablespoon, and eating fufu or to or futu or sadza or one of those African uh, staples. With a, with a tablespoon out of a bowl, so the image was familiar to me. Now, uh, a, a colleague was supposed to go with me, but he said, somebody said that there would be snakes, and he said, oh no, I'm not going. And <laughs> I, uh, I thought, oh no, no snakes. And so this is Mr. Thomas, and they, he and Miss Bertha took me for a ride, and I saw a snake. That snake, I just, maybe this thing moved too fast, sorry. But um, I saw a snake and I said, oh, there's a snake. And they didn't react. And I thought, oh, maybe that's like seeing a squirrel. <laughs> no. Then I realized something else. You know, they talked funny, those people on the Fusky Island. Well, that's when I realized that I talked funny too. <laughs> it took them a while to realize what I was saying about that snake. You know, like, snake? <laughs> Mr. Thomas, who had one eye and a bad leg, jumped out and had a guitar, went around to the trunk, got his gun, and killed a snake. So that was my welcome. <laughs> welcome to the Sea Islands. So that's the snake. And they thanked me. Well, because that's one fewer snake. They don't like the snakes. And they're dangerous. Then, how did they react to you? I went to Saplo. I went for two days, most of the ones who were in our party who were supposed to run, but I was one of them. <laughs> That was so amazing, you know. One guy woke up to me and he said, um, I didn't have my tie on that day, and he said, uh, he said, um, are you one of us or are you one of the Americans? I said, I'm one of the Americans. <laughs> but then I said, well, I could be one of you all. So Cornelia Bailey from Sapelo Island is talking about her trip to Sierra Leone and how it was so familiar. She said the food was familiar. There was smoked fish, and she said, get her smoked fish, because she hadn't seen that in a while. Um, I, this is part of a documentary that I did called um, Scattered Africa, Faces and Voices of the, Af Voices of the African Diaspora. So this is my jumping off point to talk about, she went to Africa and felt part of things. Well, I did too, and that's what I was mentioning when I was 19. I went to Cameroon, and I was welcomed home. And this is before African Americans were going to Africa to look for ancestors. I was looking for adventures, not ancestors. This was prior to roots. Um, <laughs> and a man came to lunch and said, well, you're a black American, yes. Uh, well, that means your ancestors came from Africa. I said, well, I hadn't thought about ancestors at that point. And I hadn't you know, had thought about that. And I said, well, I don't know, I guess so. And he said, well, welcome home. Welcome to the source. 
And that was the beginning of my going to Africa and thinking that I belong there too. And that that's part of my story and that you can't tell the story of the Americas, certainly, without understanding the role of Africa in the Americas. So, first thing I think it's, it's, it's fundamental to know about the Americas is who was here? We know that there, were, there had been Native Americans, most of whom were eliminated. So, let me give you some statistics. We are given the impression that the Americas was a European creation, but if you know the demographics of the creation of the Americas, it doesn't really make sense to see it as just a European creation. Of the 6.5 million people who crossed the Atlantic, during the first 300 years of the existence of the modern Americas, 5.5 million people were African, 1 million came from Europe. That's pretty basic. Did everybody know that? No, man. Uh, <laughs> well, I learned that I was bad. You know, I had a PhD. <laughs> well, I learned that. So. <laughs> send it to you. <laughs> so, at the end of the 19th century, 12 to 15 million people had come from Africa to the Americas, all of the Americas, Chile to Canada. Uh, we are given the impression that African diasporans are not every place. African diasporans are every place in the Americas. Each of the countries of the Americas has at least one organized group of African descendants. And now, apparently a third of the population of the Americas is composed of African descendants. There are more than 200 million African descendants in the Americas, and we in the United States, we know we're the center of the world, <laughs> and that the African diaspora speaks English, of course. Well, that's not true. There are more than 100 million Afro-Brazilians, so Portuguese is the first language of the African diaspora. Uh, well, first language of the African diaspora in the world. And the first, uh, Brazil is second in African descended populations after Nigeria. So there are more African descendants in Brazil than any other country in Africa other than Nigeria. Now I love this guy, Nicolas Guillen, Afro-Cuban poet. But I only love a little bit of him. He's got a poem, and I never remember its name, and I don't know the rest of it. But sin conocernos nos reconoceremos. Without knowing each other, we will recognize each other. And what I find is if you look at these indices from Polynesian culture, then they help you recognize phenomena that you find elsewhere. Yesterday, the same living thing, we were talking about having a language. Well, other African descendants in the Americas also have languages. The Taricuna in Central America, and Honduras, uh, Belize, Nicaragua, and Guatemala, they have a language. What is really frustrating to me is that the people who study the language <coughs> look for the Africanity of their language, yet the word for human being is mutu. <laughs> Bantu, mutu, human being. Um, there's palenquero in Colombia. There are the French Creoles, there are the English Creoles, there are the various languages they can say for, from uh, the Maroons in Suriname, Samaka, Juca. So, another jumping off point for understanding the global African diaspora. So, I think that we will recognize each other once we get models in our heads. For example, the ring shout. I attended uh, an event on St. Helena Island in 1999, and that's the first place I saw the ring shout. Then, when I went other places in the Americas and beyond, I began to notice African descendants dancing in a ring. Often counterclockwise, but not always. That's important. Um, so we we find similar characteristics. Not that everybody got together and said, "Hey, you gonna do it," but interestingly, people are doing the same things. Um, I was looking at my videos. I have a lot of video footage from various places, and I thought, oh, "The stereotype is true. We are always singing and dancing." <laughs> and what's wrong with singing and dancing? Uh, but then I read an article written by a, a Congo, a Ba, a Mukongo, a part of the Ba Congo uh, ethnic group that created the Congo Kingdom, that involuntarily created so many people to create the African basis of all of the Americas. And he wrote an article, this is a linguist, wrote an article about Congos dancing in Congo Square in Louisiana. 
And he talked about the fact that in French, Fela Bambula, Bambula being a colonial dance, African descended dance, Bambula meant uh, to dance, to party, but also from the French meant create disorder. <laughs> and Bambula now is a derogatory term in French for Africans and African descendants. In Kikongo, however, Bambula refers to ancestors. And he said what the Congos were saying was, we are dancing so as not to forget our ancestors. We are dancing to remember. And so then if you notice that African descendants are dancing all over the place without having gotten together and said, how are you going to remember your ancestors? Uh, dancing to remember. They were they've chosen in Paraguay, in Chile, in these are the McIntosh County chapters, 1999, at Penn Center. Uh, they have chosen to dance in circles here in the Southeast United States. I will also show you uh, Brazil, Northern Brazil, Maranhão. There's a circle. Um, I'm sure you next. Uh, I'm going to end with Uruguay, a reenactment of 19th century uh, Congo dancing. And there's one that I'm leaving out. You'll see it. <laughs> Iron for 
Yeah, about 3,000 years. Oh, Simmons, you all know that, right? From Charleston. So thinking of the fact that Africans brought rice technology to this area made me think about other technologies that Africans took to other areas of the Americas, such as iron, such as gold mining. And, but the African diaspora is not limited to the Americas as we are often led to think. This is not a patchwork quilt from this area. This patchwork quilt is from Karnataka in southwestern India. From there. And these are African people who came to Southeast Africa who are now in Karnataka, the state of Karnataka in India. And nobody believes me when I say they are Afro Indian, so I have to show you. <laughs> and the women in Karnataka make these beautiful patchwork quilts. They, do, they also perform other gestures that we may recognize. <laughs> <laughs> and they have sex. <laughs> they party when Obama arrives. That's what Indians, and they're the first to reach out. <laughs> This was all inspired by what I learned here in Dolomitica. 